a lot of this you will have heard before. As a matter of fact, in this class, three or four of the slides you will have seen before in a different format. Same information. I want to explain to you why I'm doing this. I listen to uh, a lot of Christian talk radio. I listen to some talk radio. I don't listen to as much talk radio. I kind of got tired of the talk radio um, right before and right after the election because it was just yelling. It was just noise. Um, unfortunately, some of the Christian talk radio has become the same thing. You know, it's just noise. It's just noise. And uh, But I have been listening to some things. Um, and I want you to be prepared for something. I don't think, well, let me ask you, let me ask you. How many of you have heard of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus? Have you heard of it? Okay. How many of you have heard of the, uh, let me see, let me say, make sure I say it right. The Secular Democrats of America. Of the Secular Democrats of America. Okay. Now, I bring up these things, and by the way, this is not a political thing. This is not a Democrat or Republican thing. Okay? I'm not bringing it up for that purpose. I'm not even highlighting that. It's just there is something that has come up. Actually, it should have come up over a month ago because that's when a letter was delivered to President elect. Biden. It should have come up a year ago when all of these things started forming, but it hasn't. And so it's coming up now. And if you should happen to hear about it, I want you to know what it is and, and just how pervasive it is and how to respond to it as Christians. Fair enough? <coughs> but, oh, and that's the title, The Future of Christianity in America. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. I'm sorry. It needs to sound Question, do we have a secular form of government? No. No. Yes. Yes, in a way, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> our government. Our government will be no secular being religion. I don't know. This is their day. Um, this is a question that can be debated, and, and it can be, the debate can be supported both ways. I will tell you what I think. If you think something differently, that's fine. If you think something different, that's fine. I, I believe that it is a secular form of government that was established by people who had a basic belief in God. Okay? If you remember, John Adams is famously known for for saying that our form of government is good only for a moral and religious people. It is totally inadequate for the governance of any other. Do you understand what I'm saying? In other words, our form of government cannot exist in an amoral society because of the freedoms. Okay? What is the function of Christians in our nation? To gather, not to scatter. Gather? To be a light. To stand. What? To be a light. To be a light? To stand? Yeah, well, to be salt. To be the Lord's salt. hands and feet. To be the Lord's hands and feet. And the light of people that need uh, okay. Christ. Win souls. Okay, win souls. Also, yes. to be a mouthpiece sometimes. Be a mouthpiece? <laughs> what is the function of the government in Christianity? Should be none. Keep us on our toes. <laughs> Should be none. Keep us on our toes. Us, but he gives us civil authority. He gives us governance and structure. Okay. Give the Caesar what is Caesar's and God what is God's. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What did he say? Give us an opportunity to practice biblical principles. <laughs> <laughs> because all governments are governed um, by God. I prefer but to think of it this way. The function of government. In Christianity is to get out of the way. Oh my God. Okay. Let me let me let me explain that. Let me explain that. All John, you can correct me. I'm, okay, I'm gonna change it from all to basically the Bill of Rights is a statement of things that the government cannot do. That's correct. 
Okay. Interfering in religion is one of them. Interfering in Christianity is one of them. Okay. So, is there a separation of church and state in the Constitution? I'm sorry, we have to have this civics lesson yeah. in order for me to explain yeah. why this yeah. is so important. I know y'all are going, great, great, back in government, high school government. The state is supposed to be separate because church is church, uh, by God and state is earthly bound by man. by man and God is not of man. Okay. Well, without a separation of separation of church and state in the First Amendment. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you can't abide by the First Amendment and allow people to practice their religious faith without having them stepping back and saying, we're not going to force a governmental church okay. system upon you, like Church of England. Speaking of the First Amendment, excellent segue. <laughs> this is the text of the First Amendment, in case you haven't ever actually seen it in print. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now, I want you to notice certain things. This is going to get, get sticky. The first, the first five words congress what congress the u.s congress shall make no law okay it has nothing to do now this is not the way it's seen today and it's not the way it's lived out and it's not the way it's practiced in um, political in the political world in the governmental world but it should be that Congress alone can violate the First Amendment. To say that a school can violate the First Amendment is wrong. Yes? Well, I think it might be helpful if you put in context of why the First Amendment is written as it is and why those folks had a recent living memory to write something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, King Jorge was really, I mean, he controlled the way things work. Okay? I'm not talking about that, Bob. I'm talking about the governments that went on up to about 100 years before that with the English Civil War. Yeah. Um, and that was over basically, you could be a Christian, any kind of Christian you wanted to, as long as you were Church of England. Right. You could still be a Puritan, but you still had to contribute tithes to the Church of England. And that's what caused the English Civil War, was some stained brass. Right. So that's why that, that law is right there. They also made laws. In the early part of the 18th century, especially Act of Union 1706, which combined the UK, it also specifically stated that no, no royalty, king or queen, could be a member of the Catholic faith. And that's why right. I have history. Now, now listen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's another. Here's another little thing. A little little historical fact. Yeah. Basically, this says that Congress cannot make a law establishing any religion. In other words, there can't be a state religion, like you said. Yeah. You know, Church of England. That. You know, there was no room. For However, are you aware that several of our states, several of the colonies, had state religions? Mm -hmm. You were required to be the faith of Massachusetts. You were required to be the faith of Rhode Island. You understand what I'm saying? That that was part of the that was part of the way things were structured. When this was written, it was for the federal government. It didn't apply to the states, and that's the proof of it is because the states did have laws respecting an establishment of religion. So every state that can every preamble have God's name. Yeah, yeah, they do. The they do. So I think essentially if you look, separation of church and state was really more about keeping the state out of church overall. Yeah. yeah, that's what it was supposed to be. And also uh, in light of what's going on with all the COVID stuff recently, please notice that it says the right of people peaceably to assemble shall not be abridged. But not mostly peaceful? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, mostly peaceful, whatever. Okay. I have a question. Now, here we go. Hang on. We don't have time for questions. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I don't want to spend two weeks on this. I really don't. Let's turn through it. Jefferson, President of the United States, wrote a letter to the Danbury Baptist Association in Connecticut. He was president. The Danbury Baptist Association was in Connecticut. They were already being treated as second class citizens because of their religion. The Baptists were, how shall we say, not so welcome in Connecticut. Okay? The Danbury, the Danbury Baptist Association wrote a letter to the president and said, okay, let's talk about this separation of church and state, okay? This is what is Jefferson's response was, believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship. I see that the First Amendment says, that the, and by the way, that was my paraphrase just to shorten it. I see that the legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. That's where that phrase separation of church and state comes from. It was not in the Constitution. It was in a letter that was written to the Danbury Baptist Association by the then President uh, Jefferson. He then added that the federal government was prohibited by the laws of nature and nature's God from intruding into the citizen's religious life. Okay? That's, that's what Jefferson believed about the Constitution at the time. He also wrote these things. The, uh, I think called the Kentucky Resolution, which said no power over the freedom of religion is delegated to the United States by the Constitution. In 1805, he stated that in matters of religion, its free exercise is placed by the Constitution independent of the powers of the federal government. Okay? Do you have, do you have a clear understanding of what I'm trying to get across to you so far? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, early on it, it said the state, and you have to understand what state means. State is nation. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> state is nation. It, it's not state like Texas is a state and soon to be a republic again. That's right. Hallelujah. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> that was a good one. That was a good one. I'm down with that. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> You're fine, secular Democrats of America. There you go. Now you've heard of them, right? They sent a 28 page letter or document to then <clears throat> President elect Biden. I encourage you to look it up online. I'm sending these notes out to you. You can just look at that page in the PDF and just look that up, any of that. Look up Secular Democrats of America letter and you can find the 28 page letter and read it for yourself, okay? It was prepared exclusively by Secular Democrats of America for president. Um, President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris transition team presented by representatives uh, Jamie Raskin and uh, Jared Huffman and endorsed by Representative uh, Jerry McLean. It was signed, if you will, by the Free Thought, excuse me, the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, which is a group of about 15 <laughs> Congress members who have band together as non-theists. They don't call themselves a theist. They call themselves non-theist. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. But non-theist is not as threatening as a theist. Right. You with me? Okay. They sent a letter to Biden and Harris. These that's 28 pages. I'm not giving you 28 pages. I'm giving you a couple of screens, okay? They want to push back against the white Christian nationalism. And Christian nationalism, white Christian nationalism, those terms are all the way through the document. Okay? But that's you. Okay? Well, maybe not a nationalist. You might not be a nationalist. 
but you certainly are a white Christian, and their focus is on Christianity. Under the, under the guise of white supremacists. Right. Oh, actually, the terms white supremacists are used throughout the document as well. Mm. Okay. Now, one of the things that they have in there, and they have a list of them, they want to reverse over 50 pro religious liberty executive actions and laws, including one that came out in 1993, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. I love this. It was introduced by Chuck Schumer, who was then a representative, now senator, majority leader, and Ted Kennedy. They both had basically versions of the same bill signed by Bill Clinton. Okay. In lieu of a full repeal, they want passage of a Do Not Harm Act, a bill introduced to the Senate by Vice President elect Kamala Harris in 2019 to amend that 1993 act to ensure that the law can no longer be invoked to threaten fundamental civil and legal rights. It has been used uh, recently, like in the Hobby case, Hobby, Hobby case, Hobby Lobby case. <coughs> you remember they were yes. talking about practicing their religion and how they do it. It was used there. It has been ruled unconstitutional in a couple of specific areas, but overall it still stands and they don't like it. Okay. I just think it's funny that it's <laughs> Chuck Schumer and, Seriously. and Bill Clinton, you know, and it passed unanimously in the House of Representatives, and there are only four senators that voted against it in 1993. That's very important for what I want to say to you. I want you to keep that in mind. Democrats proposed it, passed it, and not only that, it was passed unanimously in the House and 96 to 4 in the Senate. <clears throat> Has there been a shift? Oh, yeah. Big time. Yeah. Let me let you in on another little shift. The, the Congressional Free Thought Caucus is the first, the first atheistic caucus in Congress. A caucus, you can understand what caucus, there's a whole bunch of caucuses in the in the Congress, a whole bunch of them, okay? A caucus is nothing more than a group of people who band together because they have similar thoughts, similar concepts, similar ideas, similar things that they want to see accomplished. They band together in a caucus and that gives them some power because there's a group of them instead of just one of them saying something. For the first time, there are 15 congressmen, and it may be more by now, I, I didn't go back and check, but. There are 15 congressmen who have said, we want to support atheistic goals of removing religion from all aspects of the public sector. Um, That's a shift. For the first time, there is a caucus devoted to removing religion and Christianity in particular from the public square. Okay. What does that mean? Well, here's a couple of other things. They want to uh, include, non, I'm using that, their terms, non-theistic, atheistic. They, they want to include atheist chaplains in the military, which to me is the biggest oxymoron. Yes, yeah. it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. We don't want to put it in We don't believe what we do. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's nuts. Nice. I'm sorry. That, that first Paul, Paul, you got to put it in way. The devil's in the house. Yeah, the devil's in the house. That's right. The devil's in the house. They want to eliminate the motto, In God We Trust. By the way, that's a dollar bill in the background, in case you hadn't figured that out, which has In God We Trust, as does all our money. By the way, um, if you ask somebody what four words on every um, uh, coin or bill ever printed by the U.S. government, it is not In God We Trust. It's the United States of America. <laughs> but in God we trust has been on there for years, decades. Oh, yes. God we trust. Oh. God. They're going to have to redo a lot of things if they do that. I'm yeah. talking about uh, the oath you take to go in the military. A lot of that is going to be, you know, I'd be released from my oath. Yes. A lot of the stuff gets Oh, yes. Uh, and by the way, like I said, if you want to read it, go ahead. I, I'm not saying you should. Uh, I'm not saying it was a waste of my time to read it, but 
it was kind of a waste of my time to read it. Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm giving you some of the some of the highlights. Support for governors who restrict gatherings of houses of worship. It it just they want God out of the. They don't want the mention of God. How about this one? They want the government to promote an atheistic AA program, Alcoholics Anonymous program. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. Okay. They call them a higher power now, or a higher being. Well, but but no, they don't like the term higher power. They want AA out of business, and they want a secular form. Everything that you can think of that has any kind, and those 50 plus laws, they are things like, okay, um, churches have been helping during the uh, pandemic. Churches have been doing a lot to support people, to buy food for people and all that. They want that done away with. What? They don't want the government to recognize that. They don't want... Uh, one of the things that that uh, Trump did, and I'm not bragging on Trump, I'm just saying that one of the things that he did in the face of this was he actually mobilized a lot of faith partners and government partners to work together in order to meet the, the needs that were necessary. Um, it happened right here at our church. You realize that the school was handing out lunches right down there on our drive -thru. Yeah. Yeah. They don't want that. Yeah. Are you with me now? Yeah. Raise some money for or raise some food for bread partners. Yeah, yeah. If anybody wants to bring cans next week. Okay, good, yeah. good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, Bob, they've already started doing that too because Texas Baptist men, um, when they bring their trailers and stuff, they actually FEMA says you gotta cover up your signs. Oh, yeah. you, become, you are FEMA now. Yeah. Basically, so mm. we don't want you getting credit. Well, yeah. That's not why they have it. It's on their right, drive. right. They, 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 and they, they still do it. Push in that for a while. Yes, but yes. they said we'd rather serve than exactly, recognize exactly. Over here, so mm -hmm. exactly. But it's still kind of interesting. Why? Why does it matter? And they well, do, do any of these people study history? I mean, this has worked so well in the past right. when, when this has been tried in other places. I understand, and I don't think so. And they, and they miss the irony of, of a non-theistic chaplain, which is the establishment of a religion, yeah. essentially. Uh, yeah, with no, everything no, no, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, don't, don't try to read sense into this. <laughs> you don't, can't read sense into knowledge. And what's, what's really sad is they believe that their cause is based on reason and science. So much for the crayons in our face. Anyway, I'm sorry, we're going on. Believe me, this has a point. <laughs> These are just some of the things that have happened within the last two weeks. Yeah, Mike right before opened up his church, the very first one. The Calvary, yes, it is. Yeah. Um, Grace Community Church, some of you know their pastor, uh, is John MacArthur. Yeah. Okay. The church in Albuquerque was fined 10,000. There was another church in Albuquerque that was fined. 5,000, apparently they didn't have as many people <laughs> they got together. These things are going on. However, they are not happening as frequently as you might think. Okay? There's one big reason why and one smaller reason why, and there's probably a thousand reasons why. One big reason why is the churches are not meeting. Okay. A second one is there's a lot of there's a lot of sheriffs and police chiefs and mayors and people like that that really don't want to jump into that ring of fire. <laughs> okay. Um, and I've said this before, and I'll, I'll say it again. I believe that our church would have been standing on solid constitutional grounds if we had decided to remain open. Okay, I do not fault Ross, Troy, any of the staff, the deacon body, the trustees. I don't fault any of them, you know, in, in what they chose to do, especially Ross. He was, he was, he was doing what he felt was the right thing to do, and, and I follow his leadership, and I agree with him. Okay, I don't, I don't have any problem with that. When Bob had been fairness, we didn't know enough about it. Right. If it was an evil lie, we'd all be dead. 
Right. I mean, literally, right. If it spread like Ebola, it is. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So that's what they didn't know what was happening. To right. Right. Sure that right. You understand? I, I'm just saying, um, you know, there's a lot of things that have, have uh, transpired lately. And uh, the, the problem becomes this. If the state, local, or federal government looking at the pandemic says, you know what, they'll shut down if we tell them to. Right. I want you to hear me. Hear me out. Hear me out. It is possible to come up with a crisis that's so dire that it needs to happen again. Mm -hmm. You understand? Uh, I don't know, weeks ago, a few months ago, whatever it was, I was talking with you about the World Economic Forum and what they were doing to, uh, to usher in a, a new world, so to speak. They have been trying for years to do it on the basis of climate change. It hadn't worked. Pandemic came. We got something now. We got something we can act on. Yeah, buddy. And it is possible. I'm not going to predict anything. But it's possible that climate change might become that next impetus for federal or state or local governments. The number one existential threat. Yes, yes. Bob, it already has. Um, I'm going on 27 years this year in oil and gas. Yeah. And uh, we're seeing things now that we've always talked about yeah. have an impact on climate change. But the executive orders, the pipeline, nobody cares about. The Marine Canadian oil now. But what people aren't talking about are all the other executive orders he's writing that are directly aimed at right. oil and gas. And it's, it's not a big deal for me for the jobs. It's the independence that we had. Right. I don't think that everyone understands how important that was that we had that energy independence. <clears throat> and you also know which is which is why we became energy independent. Which if you the, look, it, when we had energy independence, we right. had zero, not zero, we had very little confrontation. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow. That's right. I, I'm just saying it is possible that this could come again about again. And we are conditioned now to go along with it. Do you think so? A lot of sheep out there. I'm just saying. Okay, so what is a Christian to do in the face of this assault on religious freedom in America? Lock and load. Okay, here we go. Lock and load. <laughs> yeah, got right. You got to be smart and get ahead of the curve. Okay, these are the these are the slides that I've shown you before. This is nothing new. What are you supposed to do? Remember that you're children of the king in a foreign land. You live in a foreign land. You're children of the king, though. You are citizens of heaven. We are only visitors in this country. We are only visitors here. We are ambassadors for our homeland, God's kingdom. You understand? We've got to have a different perspective. We are salt. We are light. We are watchmen. Those are some of the things that we talk, talked about right at the beginning. What are we supposed to do? How about this? You've seen this before. What are we supposed to do? Subject yourselves to the governing authorities? That's what Romans 13 says. Okay? Honor authority to show others what godliness looks like in society. If you read 1 Peter 2, 13 through 16, that's exactly what, what, is, being, what is being taught there. It's, he's saying, look, you know, you're in a rough situation. Show them what godliness looks like. You know, show them how peaceful you can be in the face of persecution. Pray for those in political authority for the sake of peace and tranquility and participate in the process. Make sure you participate in the process. Write your congressman. Do all of those things. Vote. Get involved. Do get involved in the process. And then when there's a conflict, Honor and trust God in spite of the circumstances. When there's a conflict between honoring God and honoring the government, you've got to honor God first. You have to. Be prepared for nonviolent civil disobedience. Be prepared. Now, all of a sudden, guys, I've said this twice before to this class. All of a sudden, 
that be prepared for civil disobedience, all of a sudden it takes on a real meaning, doesn't it? All of a sudden it's going, okay, okay, okay. Be prepared to calmly answer accusations. Be prepared to calmly oppose a ruling. Huh? Use the governmental policies to your advantage, like the Bill of Rights. Now, guys, I've shown you those things before. I hope now you're starting to get an idea that it's for real. But that's not all. Would someone look up Acts 4, 23 and 24? Somebody look up Ephesians 6, 18 through 20. Acts 4, verse 23, I got it. Okay, Acts 4, 23 and 24, read it out. Yes, sir. All right, 23, um, right here. All right. When they were released, uh, they went to their friends and reported what the chief uh, priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in the city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, <clears throat> along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do, to do whatever your hand and plan has for destined to take place. Okay. Did you notice what it said? What are these Gentiles raising up against? <clears throat> God Almighty. Since when they were released, they prayed boldly. Would you read Ephesians 6, 18 through 20? Go for it. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right word so I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan that the good news is for Jews and Gentiles alike. I am in chains now, still preaching this message as God's ambassador. So pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for him, as I should. In the face of hot, those hostile Jesus, pray for boldness. Boldness. Somebody look up Ephesians 6, 12 through 13. Thank you, we're in Ephesians 6, you're right there. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 4. Who has 1 Corinthians passage? Anybody? I'll give it. Got it. How about Ephesians 6, 12 through 13? I got it. Okay. Go ahead. Write it out. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go for it. <laughs> All, right. All right. For we waste not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of the world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Where, wherefore, take and do the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand an evil day, having done all to stand. In the face of those hostile to Jesus, recognize first who the real enemy is. It's not the Democrats. It's not the Republicans. It's not the independents. It's not the congressman. It's not the mayor. It's not the president. It is Satan. That's right. It's not a political party. It's not the uh, Congressional Free Thought Caucus. It's Satan. You understand? It's Satan. And first remember that and then strap on. If you ain't strapping on, if you ain't strapping on your armor, you're going down, baby. You're going down when this thing, when these things hit you. You're going down. You're gonna fold like a cheap lawn chair. <laughs> <laughs> you are. Like a Walmart. Like you don't know like a Walmart chair. <laughs> some of those babies three or four times and then they fall. <laughs> okay, here we go. Here we go. First Corinthians 16, 13 and 14. Watch, stand back in the faith, be brave and strong, let all that you do be done to us. All right, you got it? In the face of those hostile to Jesus, stand firm, be strong, and do it all in love. That's where we tend to miss the mark. You know, we just want to lash out. We just want to lash out. Now, Facebook full of people lashing out. They just lash out, lash out, lash out. That's all they do, lash out. <laughs> Am I right? You know I'm right. That's right. They tear each other up. They tear each other up, spit each other out. 
We need to do things in love. But always, and this is another one that you've seen before, I've got to keep coming back to it because it's so important. We have to keep the main thing, the main thing, the Great Commission. Notice it does not say that we are to go, therefore, and make Republicans of all nations. It does not say go, therefore, and make conservatives of all nations or make liberals of all nations or make Democrats of all the nations are make libertarians. Okay, you can make libertarians. So that's an industry in time. Okay. Conservative leaning. Yeah, conservative leaning libertarian. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. It says make disciples. And by the way, disciples are not people who just say I do to Jesus. No. They are people who are taught his ways and taught to walk in his ways by you when you lead them to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It's not a one and done deal. No. It's not a get them saved and send them back. No. Every day, every it's a get them day. saved and make disciples. You can't make a disciple of someone who doesn't believe, so you have to start off with the belief. But that's what we're supposed to do. That's what we're supposed to do. I'm going to read another passage to you. This is from, oh, good, we're going to make it on time. Yay. Sort of, almost. <laughs> I've got 20 seconds, about two minutes to go. Here we go. This is from Matthew 10. By the way, I don't have this on the chart. Okay. Not sure why. Well, I do know why. It's because I changed this all up yesterday. After hearing about those secular Democrats and, and hearing people rail against them. Okay. This is from Matthew chapter 10. Jesus is sending his disciples out. The beginning of chapter 10, he actually names the disciples. Starting in uh, verse 11, he starts to send them out. He's sending them out, right? And he says this, Whatever town or village you enter, search for some worthy person there and stay in his house until you leave. As you enter the home, get at your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet. When you leave that home or town, by the way, that's an old expression. I mean, that's a biblical expression. That means forget about it. Hey, forget about it. Okay? Shake the dust. Yeah. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet. I'll tell you the truth. It will be more, top, more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. I am sending you out like sheep among the wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard against the men against men. They will hand you over to the local councils and flog you in their synagogue. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. Notice it says, you won't be brought to them at, concerning your crimes. You will be brought to them as witnesses. Mm -hmm. Opportunity knocks. Yeah. Okay. When they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it at that time. You will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death and father his child. Children will bring up, rebel against their father. Okay, I'm jumping down. I'm sorry. So do not be afraid. This is uh, 26. So do not be afraid of them. There is nothing concealed that not will be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim it from the roots. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So what are we supposed to do? I'll tell you, boys and girls, be bold. Do you realize that most of us, bless his heart, Joe Baker was making a difference in this world. He was living out his faith. He was doing something. Do you realize that most of the people in this church, I'm not talking about y'all, but most of the people in this church, could actually, in their hearts, deny Christ, and no one would be able to tell the difference. Are you aware that if people don't know where you stand with Jesus Christ, there's a problem? Future Christian Christianity in America will not be determined by the power of those in authority in our government or by the laws enacted by those governing bodies. It's not the future of Christianity does not lie in laws or in governance. It lies in the power of God, which can be restrained only, only 
only by Christians as they choose how boldly they will speak, serve, minister, and love in the name of Christ. That is the only restraint that's put on God's power. You hold the keys. You hold the keys. You have God's power. It doesn't matter who says what in Congress. It doesn't matter how many secular people line up and say, we're getting rid of God in America. No, you ain't. Not as long as I'm standing. He's right here. And he's living on. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that no matter what happens around us, and we know, Father, that a lot of these people are just whistling in the wind. But we know, Father, too, that Things are changing. Father, remind us that you have the ultimate power and that that power is available to us through the spirit of Jesus Christ within us, through the blood of the Lamb. Help us to walk in that power, live in that power, act in that power, speak in that power, and especially love in that graceful power. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.